Vivian Lab is. Um, so Vivian Lab started just a few months ago. It's only maybe two or three months, to be honest. And we have had tremendous um, interest from women and employers uh, in, in Greece and in Europe. So um, basically our vision is that, uh, and our like guiding uh, uh, line is that uh, from the first period to menopause, you deserve better healthcare. And essentially what we're saying is that women are often dismissed by the healthcare system or they're struggling um, with issues uh, around their health. And these create blockers in their employment as well. So our goal is to empower women with accessible personalized healthcare and help them make informed decisions about themselves and their families. And at the same time, support employers to retain motivated employees, reduce costs and enhance productivity. Um, so this is um, what we, uh, we, we wanna achieve with the support of a very strong network and why, like how, what has been our inspiration. I will only share like a few uh, interesting points that um, made us come up with this vision. We're a small team that is working behind the project. Uh, and of course, um, Emma is gonna walk us through the comprehensive research, but what's happening um, at the moment is shocking and maybe not a lot of people are aware. Um, uh, last year was the year of the great resignation after COVID. Um, like there, there is a huge gap uh, in, in talent across all industries. Imagine that only last year, 50 million people left their employment uh, in the US. So people are leaving their workplace. Um, and on top of that, 60% of employees are considering of leaving their job because they don't get enough family benefits. Um, top that with 30% of first-time mothers never coming back to work because they're not supported. And on top of that, there are additional conditions, chronic conditions such as endometriosis that create extra headwinds for women to continue their work. Um, so we see like a really big trend in the US uh, and globally, and the vast majority of, of people say that they would switch jobs to gain fertility and family benefits. And that's a really big and interesting insight for employers and women leaders. And just a few things on, on the, like what we call chapter menopause. Um, if you follow our community and social, we have thousands of members and women and uh, doctors and scientists. And we talk a lot about menopause because this is a little bit um, in, in a way shocking that the data we see. Uh, so menopause causes 150 billion in productivity losses worldwide. And um, women essentially say that this interferes with their work. And it's, it's menopause is something that half the population uh, is, gonna, uh, is gonna go through. So all women are gonna go through menopause. Uh, and by uh, 2025, there will be more than 1 billion women experiencing menopause. So you can imagine what the impact would be for the women themselves and the employers who wanna retain um, a motivated talent pool. Um, so we see that women who face um, symptoms during the menopause period, which can last for many years, it could be even a decade, um, they, uh, they have uh, a lot of issues to continue their work, they're not supported, they're leaving the workplace, and they have uh, more work productivity loss days, and this uh, equates to more uh, costs for the healthcare system. This discussion has um, opened widely in the US, um, and we see really influential personalities such as Michelle Obama or Oprah Winfrey talking about this topic um, and uh, supporting women and employers through this journey. Um, there is also a very interesting article that we can share afterwards, um, which is called Am I Useless Now? And it talks about the gap uh, in the workplace. And um, we see that women are taken aback by the symptoms of menopause. And uh, the symptoms could be not just what we all know, like as hot flashes, it could be brain fog, it could be um, uh, bone loss, it could be fatigue, it could be insomnia, it could be anxiety. So all of these interfere with the ability to work. And although women want to continue working, uh, if they don't get the right support in the workplace, they're gonna leave the workplace at an age around 50, when they're at the top of their career and they have secured leadership positions. So the impact is huge. Um, and they say that 50s is the most challenging decade in the workplace for women. So all of this is, I think, a very interesting context for us. Um, and we're going to hear lots of interesting insights from, from uh, our panelists today. Uh, but essentially, this is what we want to achieve as, as Vivian Lab at the moment. We want to support both women leaders and employers to find the right balance and the right solution so that uh, 
uh, we can all of us achieve our goals. So uh, I'm really looking forward to, to listening to our great panelists. So Olga, back to you. Thank you so much, Gina. Thank you for the inspiring opening. Um, before I move on to Emma for her to share um, the data, just a couple of housekeeping also information, just so you all know we have a Q&A that is open. So please feel free to key in any questions you may have. I'll be monitoring this and using the questions to inform our conversation with the panelists. And um, we will share material from this conversation later in our channel. So please make sure that you follow us. We're on Instagram or LinkedIn. We uh, have a community there, and we will try to wrap up in an, in an hour's time from from now. Um, I think I've covered all of my housekeeping. So Emma, over to you to take us through some data points and contextualize the conversation. Thanks, Olga. Yes, happy to, and and great to be here with all of you today. Um, so I, I will be sharing a little bit more of what we're seeing uh, kind of more broadly across um, the workplace, less to do specifically with um, access to healthcare. But I think, you know, we all recognize that there's an important overlap between women in the workplace and the, the health care that they receive. Um, so we're seeing um, that companies are facing really two major challenges in their pipeline. In addition to the persistence of the broken rung in terms of advancement into leadership positions, women are also leaving their companies at the highest rates we've ever seen. Um, I think as, as Gina and Olga mentioned, this great resignation or the great breakup as we're calling it. Um, so if we take a closer look, since we started doing this research eight years ago, we have seen slow but steady progress in terms of the representation of women. Um, and this is a view of um, within, within the US. Um, on this visual, we see representation of women across roles um, from entry level to C-suite um, as of the end of 2021. And if we compare this representation to the end of 2016, we see that women's representation has increased across the pipeline with the greatest increases actually at the top, um, seven percentage points at SVP level, six percentage points in C-suite. So there are signs of continued progress, but we know there's still room for improvement. Uh, and for example, we see especially um, the need for improvement for um, a representation of for women of color. Um, well, one in four C-suite leaders is a woman, only one in 20 is a woman of color. So previously raised the alarm bell um, that we're at risk of losing senior women um, in leadership positions. And what we have seen in the data is that this has come true. We are in the midst of, of what we're calling the great breakup. Women are demanding more from, from their work um, and women leaders defined as senior managers or above are leaving their companies in unprecedented numbers to get it. Um, the gap between voluntary attrition rates for men and women leaders is the largest it's been since we started tracking this eight years ago. So why, why are we seeing this? Why is it happening? One, we're seeing that women are facing greater headwinds at work. Um, women are 10 percentage points more likely to have a coworker take credit for their idea uh, compared to male leaders. Women leaders are also twice a, as likely to be mistaken for someone more junior to them compared to male leaders. Second, women leaders are, are overworked um, and, and under-recognized. They're two times more likely to spend time on diversity, equity, and inclusion activities for their colleagues and for their workplace, but only 40% say they're actually recognized for those efforts. Um, and 43% of female leaders report feeling burnt out compared to 31% of men. So pretty big delta there. Third, women leaders want a better workplace and, and culture. Um, Nearly twice as many female leaders want um, flexibility in their jobs and, and they're leaving to find it. Um, you know, I think particularly of note, a bit of an aside, but women are not just overworked in the office. They're also sh shouldering a disproportionate burden in the home. Um, what we see in the data is that as men advance, they do less and less household labor. Um, the story is different for women. 
at entry level, women are about twice as likely as men to be doing most or all of, of their family's household labor. And this gap actually doubles for female leaders. Uh, so women leaders are four times as likely as men to be doing all or most of their family's household labor. So as you take a step back and kind of think about this backdrop of women, you know, trying to advance in their careers, navigating challenges with, with menopause, um, you know, at, at age 45 plus, and then also shouldering the disproportionate burden of, of care at home, um, this great resignation, if you will, starts to, to feel less surprising. So what do we actually do about it? You know, I think this is a, a set of thought starters, but certainly not the, you know, the final answer. Um, you know, I think one, we think there's real power in disaggregating the data that's shared so that we can actually track at a more granular level what's happening across the course of the pipeline and figure out, you know, where are the interventions needed most. Um, two, you know, I think a lot of companies have sort of commitments on, on paper, but actually bringing those commitments to life in practice um, is going to be critical. It's not just about, you know, offering a program, but actually, you know, supporting it with, with real actions. Um, third, creating accountability around um, these, these initiatives, um, rewarding leaders who are stepping up, actually holding specific KPIs against them. Um, Fourth thing, really critical, one of the big reasons we see women leaving is because they want greater flexibility to fit work into their lives. So as, as companies, how can we redefine how work gets in, gets done, have more, more hybrid work options, relax and, and change guidelines, actually, you know, enable person to, to work um, from, from where they are. Um, Fifth is just equipping managers with, with greater um, coaching for how to support female leaders and actually, you know, put, put these, these initiatives into practice. Um, and then finally, you know, supporting the, the whole employee and, and, you know, ensuring that they can balance um, work and life. And then one thing that's not on this page, but I think will, will become a discussion today is what are the commitments companies can make to actually support menopause benefits in the workplace in the same way that today we support fertility benefits more and more in the workplace, normalize it, make it part of healthcare, such that, you know, women can actually get the care that they need and not have it be, be kind of a, a distraction for them um, from, from the work that they want to do. So. I'll pause there for, for any questions. Wow, every time, and thank you so much, Emma, for taking us through the data. Every time I see the data, I have these mixed feelings of being fascinated by how you've been able actually to capture and quantify a reality that we can talk about, but sometimes we cannot explain into words, we cannot put our finger on it. At the same time, I'm shocked by this reality. On, However, we have made a lot of steps to be able to be like here today talking about those topics, something that we wouldn't have been able to do a few a few years ago. The fact that we articulate not only what the situation is, but also how we can change it is, is definitely a step forward. Thank you so much. And we will actually keep referring back to the data that you that you mentioned. I would love to hear from our panel, and um, if I can start with you, Nikki, to introduce yourself, and um, if in order, actually, you can just introduce yourselves and tell us either a comment on something from what Emma shared with us, or tell us why is this conversation important for you? That would be fantastic. Thank you, Olga, and thanks, everyone, and uh, a warm gratitude to Vivian Love for inviting me over today as well to be joining this conversation. So today I'm with you in my capacity as a leadership coach. Uh, I work with um, uh, men and women in leadership positions, but really support them in, towards uh, deciding what their leadership goal is and achieving it professionally. I'm also um, a co-leader of Leaning Network Greece, which is effectively um, the network that we have established and set up and run in Greece uh, of, of Lenin. So Lenin is, a, is an international organization uh, that has the um, its uh, base in uh, uh, California and it was founded by Sheryl Sandberg about 10 years ago. And the mission of the organization is to support women at the workplace, to support women towards advancing their careers. 
Um, Linin have actually been a partner to McKinsey in uh, launching and running the, the um, report that Emma has just uh, shared with us. And the findings are indeed staggering. In, 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 in being with you today, I, I empathize with so, so much that is shared on a, on, a, um, on a feminist advancement level, as well as a career development level but also personally, like through, through my own uh, experience and, um, and, and work so far. I uh, just wanted to mention here that in my professional career, I also work as a finance counsel with an international law firm. And I am a mother of four children, which really you know, explains a lot about how all of this really resonates with me personally. Um, so women, you know, women should be talking more about these things. This is what it really comes down to in, 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 in more than one ways. Um, effectively, what we see through the uh, research, but also other evidence and, um, and um, uh, work that Lenin has done on this field is how women suffer from a, a, lots of different kinds of bias, from a series of bias um, that actually affect their performance and their, um, their willingness to, to, to step forward and advance their careers one of them being the likability bias you know it, it's also known as the likability penalty this is this is uh the the bias that, that's rooted on how um as a society as people we expect women to be more um to be more um uh, understanding uh, not to be so direct not to be assertive not to be aggressive or bossy which are words rather used to describe men in the workplace rather than women and this kind of bias is often lies right at the root of the problem here it is one of the reasons why women are often hesitant to step forward and share issues of health and well-being that they might be facing with their work so we often see women to be very silent about it. So I, you know, I, I, I work so often with so many talented female leaders who are in their late forties, in their fifties. They have gone through a series of, um, you know, uh, wellness and health uh, transitions in their lives. Many of them likely to be to have gone or going through menopause. Um, and the, the, the standard reaction that, that you see is these women um, to just uh, not raise it at all at work. Many of them feel ignored or sidelined. And this also comes, comes up in research that was carried out by uh, Tinsley Fix recently. So um, they, they try to just keep their head down, uh, do whatever they can to sort out um, their personal issues without sharing them. Just they focused on staying employed, um, and this and this is affected by an array of things, right? Menopause is, is just one of them, but it can also be other health issues, mental wellness, ageism, a lot of other things that a, a woman might be experiencing in her professional career, um, in, in her personal life that affect her professional career. So, um, uh, and this all comes in an age where women are already advanced in their careers and the leadership position like in your like in your 40s and your 50s is when you should actually be thriving not not hiding and just keeping your head down and we see uh, all of these issues the, the the wellness issues and the health issues actually chipping away at their confidence this is uh, why it's um of utmost importance that women voice these things out daily you know they, they, they must feel free to share this in the workplace to say you know this is what i'm going through right now this is how it's affecting me this is the support that i need i need to stay um engaged and to stay active and to keep um leading in my in my sphere of work uh so we should absolutely encourage women to, to just be more vocal about it bring this issue to the table speak to their colleagues, engage with their employers, engage with the wider community, and most of all, engage with community supporting women as well. There are lots of networks like Lean In all over the world. Lean In is uh, it's a very uh, big network, it's an international network. It has presence in over 183 countries today. Uh, so, you know, we just get so much feedback from women joining the network saying, I never knew that what I'm going through is normal. 
And suddenly I no longer feel alone. And now I know that I can voice these things and I can take energy and, and, and inspiration from your work and actually uh, be more present in my career. So this is what I, what I would absolutely encourage women to do, to just bring the issue of, of healthcare on the table and uh, demand whatever support you can get, including support through you know, initiatives like Vivian Lab from your employer and your communities, because I think it's, it's, it's really going to uh, make the difference. Thank you, Nikki. And I know that as we open actually the conversation, we would love to hear from you more about how to do that and what's the appropriate way actually to bring those and having you through your multiple roles that you play in your daily life, but also through Lean In, I think having McKinsey that with partnership with Lean In have done all this research, we kind of in a way cover all the bases to really talk about it uh, with the necessary, in the necessary depth in the necessary way. Thank you. Dimitri, Shall we, shall we go to you? Um, why is this important um, from your perspective and from your role? Yeah, thank you, Olga. And uh, um, of course, my name is Dimitris Stroblis and uh, I, I kind of uh, represent the, the minority here of, of, of men, but actually I represent the majority of employees that uh, um, I have worked for more than 15 years in companies. And uh, um, actually the last 15 years, I have uh, passionate work uh, uh, in supporting the balance in gender diversity. Uh, this was part of, uh, and it still is part of uh, strategies of all companies, because this is uh, one of the most important aspects to uh, manage to bring the progress and the performance uh, of a company, which uh, without uh, the, the balance in diversity, it cannot be achieved. That, that is proven 100%, because the, the way that uh, um, women and men thinking collaborates well, and, and, and this uh, uh, complements in the success of uh, um, the lives of our companies. So, um, to be honest, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working towards supporting um, many ways of uh, how to uh, create an environment which is friendly um, um, and uh, creates this atmosphere of everything to belonging and being inclusive. And I, before um, I was um, um, uh, contacted by Gina, uh, I, I wasn't fully aware of the menopause severe impact uh, that brings to the companies. Of course, we worked towards initially on uh, attracting uh, women into the um, uh, work environment, then develop them and retain them. And throughout these stages, we were trying to support with certain areas. As you mentioned, the first big one was the maternity. And we realized that, uh, that many women are uh, leaving jobs just after maternity because they cannot cope with um, uh, this kind of uh, responsibilities, which uh, I think we are towards the, the, the solving these issues by providing uh, full customized or dedicated support to all people. And this equality and equity, uh, this is across um, uh, all, all levels. So um, uh, to be honest, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major topic that uh, after Gina mentioned and I heard Emma's um, uh, survey and, and research, um, I started talking. Uh, I started talking internally and I said like, uh, this is not an, a, a, a recent issue. It's just an issue that came up. Came up because probably we identified that uh, we are losing this accumulated uh, experience and knowledge at the, the, the level where the women have reached the top uh, of their leadership, uh, managerial level, and, and this is kind of, uh, um, uh, to be honest, not affordable by, by, by missing that part of, uh, in, in any company. So um, I feel like what uh, I, I will definitely echo and amplify what uh, Nikki mentioned, uh, that speaking, speaking up is, is the most important aspect. We need to understand, uh, me from an HR perspective, of course, I live that through uh, my mother, maybe my uh, relatives, maybe my wife. So you all live this kind of um, menopause um, change in a woman's life, but we have never paid attention on how to support the at this stage uh, through the uh, uh, through the work levels and to uh, make an environment where we'll definitely feel like they they are um, somehow understood. 
So Nikki, um, yes, definitely um, need to speak up. We need to create cultures that, and, and also from the early stages of, um, of, uh, of children, we should uh, raise them by knowing when they need to speak up and uh, uh, tell their opinions or their issues is is then when we can uh, apply customized uh, and individual solutions as well because i don't feel like one size fits all so um, i'm i'm really honored to be part of this uh, uh, panel among uh, esteemed uh, professionals women's and uh, leaders and mothers so thank you olga and gina for inviting me uh, to represent companies and hr world Yes, thank you so, so much, Dimitris, and actually to represent it with all your, all your experience, because you're carrying all these years of experience, you've seen a lot of things, you've seen things that have gone well, things have wor worked, things that haven't worked, so it's really an honor that we have your voice on our panel. I love what you're saying about speaking up and the importance of listening, and listening is the first step towards everything, uh, really raising awareness and solving problems. Uh, moving on to May, May... Would you like to introduce yourself, please, and tell us why this topic actually matters to you? Yes, of course. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is May Zani. I'm the co-founder of Women Act, an NGO in uh, Athens, Greece. We were founded in uh, 2017. Our base is Athens. We have 15 hubs all over Greece. There are eight co-founders. And what our aim is to empower women to um, go for leadership positions in the public sphere of Greece. We are an organization which is focused on the public sphere. We don't just mean politics, which is mainly what we're known for, but also business, media, and civil society. Turning into our subject today, I would say that I wouldn't be me if I didn't talk about leadership and how it carries a responsibility when it comes to today's topic. What I mean is that women leaders, those who have finalize, I mean, who have achieved the positions of power that we all strive for, should not only open the door for younger women to enter and mentor them, but they should also talk about issues such, a, such as the one today. We have a society that keeps pretending that women don't age, and if they do, it's a bad thing, that women should look a specific way, that they should cultivate a brand of their own, that they should run for office without talking about difficult things. And uh, we should stop that. We should uh, create networks of support when it comes to it. Civil society has a huge role to play. We should have more allies. And men here are crucial to that, to remove the stigma from talking about these things. Mentoring can play a huge role. We should have generations of women talking to each other so that we, I mean, most of the women that Women Act has are in their 30s and 40s and 50s, and they should know that they're going to change and it's going to be a huge challenge and they should prepare because unless we acknowledge what's happening, we can't prepare for it. And this is something that Let's face it, our fast world is not exactly equipped. We love our tweets and we love social media and images and all that. That doesn't really enable conversations to be had and it doesn't allow the truth to come out. And the truth is what, I mean, what we heard from Emma, all these very interesting facts point that women need help and they need to support each other and they need men included in that and they need networks of support everywhere. So I'm, I'm hoping that female leaders will actually be the ones initiating all this. And this is where Women Act hopefully can play a role. It's the first time we are talking about this issue, but we've talked about self-leadership when we did uh, two events on how women uh, should quit smoking as an act of self-leadership, which was quite a rare thing to do as a organization that concerns the public sphere, but we thought, you know, we're asking you to run for office and to strive for huge positions. And yet you should start from home and you should take care of yourself and your body. And two days ago, I just got back from Orestiada, which is one of the um, northest cities we have. I think it is the one anyway, close to the border with Turkey. And we had 90 women come up to the uh, opening of our hubs. And the, our main speaker, our keynote speaker, was saying, you know, start by taking better care of yourself and then let the woman from Women Act tell you 
to run for things, but you know, you should start from yourself. So this is how I'd like to, to start too. Thank you. That's beautiful, May. Thank you so much. And um, I'm so grateful we have you here. You're so right with like starting with, uh, in a way, basics, right? Let's cover the basics first before we move on to anything else. So while I have you, could you please actually tell us, do you see the headwinds that women face to be influencing or impacting the goals that they set themselves? And how, how much do you see this around you? Well, I couldn't say that I don't see them. I mean, I, I see them even when we have uh, events at Women Act and I see the struggle that women are facing between taking care of two generations at home, how often our speakers need to dash off instead of staying for an extra networking cocktail or something. And it might seem like a small thing, but it's a big thing, not feeling in control of your life and thinking that too many things and too many people are dependent on you. And then the, the, there's this inner controversy with yourself when you go to work or you have a high powered job where everyone tells you that you're doing great and you're fantastic. And yet you have this imposter syndrome say, you know, one of these balls is going to drop any second now and people will realize I'm not. So yes, things are tough for women at any age, but I think as they're facing those well-being and health challenging times, it makes them feel even less in control. So we have all these amazing women leaders in the public sphere, and I think they should come out and talk uh, in civil society forums or in more official capacities about the changes that need to be done in our society, especially in places like Greece, where let's face it, women still take care of almost everyone. I think I'm trying to think of something they don't take care of at home and at work. And we should, we should think about it and think about Especially, you know, Nikki talked about being the mother of four children, and I'm the mother of one daughter, actually. And I was thinking, you know, is this the kind of society and this the kind of place I want her to, to, to grow up and to lead? Would I like things to be the same in 20 years when she's in her 30s and working and trying to, to, to have a family and then also thinking about the future ahead? I mean, I do feel we have a responsibility here to make things better for our daughters and for our sons, because this is also something, it, it's not a gender thing. It has to do with democracy and it has to do with being able to, to be the best you can be. And it's really powerful how you talk about the responsibility that women and people in power have to talk openly about what it took them to get there. I love how you're talking about essentially using their privilege to pave the way for anyone who wants to follow them. Um, and also the responsibility they have actually to drive change. This is really powerful message. Nikki, you mentioned though about also speaking up. How does this though speak up feel or look like when someone hasn't reached the point of being a leader? They don't have necessarily, they haven't reached the point of their career that they want. As they grow within their career, how can women speak up and talk about what they need and demand what they need? I wish we I wish we had a couple of hours to discuss just this. I mean, there's so many stories that I can share for myself as well as from women of our network, from women that I have coached through their leadership roles. Um, I can I can start with this tiny little example. It it's it's little opportunities that we come across every single day. Let, let's just start from that. Um, I recall myself, uh, okay, once I've had my, my first two children before, before the twins, um, I, I went back to work after a very short maternity leave. I, I, did, I went back to what I knew what to do best, you know, work hard, be devoted um, to my work, um, you know, just uh, continue my career, excel at what I do professionally. Um, and I remember how, how acutely I sometimes felt all these different kinds of bias that I mentioned earlier, including the bias of how um, women are actually better placed for the, 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 the private sphere as opposed to the public sphere, being, you know, that women are better placed for, to look after, you know, their families and, do, and things of private life, their their wider, um, their wider um, uh, relatives, et cetera, relative network, et cetera, as opposed to the public sphere, politics, business, 
um, the community, you know. So this was one of the things that I, I felt I was perceiving living and working in Greece at the time. And I recall that, um, um, you know, being dedicated for me at work meant that I have to cut off everything else, never portray anything personal at my work, never speak about how I'm having a, a really bad day or how something uh, personal is actually impacting my performance, never raising any of that. So I remember I was on this conference call one day um, with lots of counterparts and clients neg negotiating some very difficult, uh, you know, financings, a, work, a tr transaction that we were working on. When one of my colleagues, male colleagues um, of, of a very senior level, um, in the middle of the call, and that was like six years ago, it was pre-COVID, they interrupted and said, oh, hang on a minute. And they turned around and started speaking to um, their daughter. So they said, you know, um, Miriam, blah, blah, blah. Why, why don't we do this later? Let me go back to my call. So they interrupted the call to actually interact with a child. And then they, they went back to the call and, and the rest of the call just went on as normal. You know, like no, there was not, not an issue that this person has actually interrupted their work. Um, you know, their uh, business communications actually speak, speak to the child. And at that moment, when this happened, I felt, oh, how dare they? I would never dare stop a business call in the middle or put a client on hold while something personal is happening, be it my child wanting attention or, you know, my husband having to raise an urgent query or myself feeling in, in, in one way or another or actually experiencing a, a health uh, concern. I would never, I would never dare do that. That was pre-COVID, and, and I emphasize this because I think COVID has taught us, taught us a lot in this regard. So we've all had to work from our homes, engage with lots of um, uh, different activities, uh, showcase how we managed to do all that. So now it's perfectly accept acceptable probably today to actually break you know, from a conference call to actually speak to someone in, in a private space or show that you're working from home. So things have changed a little bit, but... Um, I, I just want you to draw, draw you back to that feeling of, oh, I cannot share any of this because I'm going to be perceived as not liked, as weak, as, you know, dedicated to my family, but not my work. Shed, shed all that away. I mean, just, just literally just drop any of those thoughts and stay focused to what you as a person need at that moment and at that stage in your lives. It, it's essential to actually stay close to what you need as a person so that you can convey that and communicate this um, better uh, at the workplace. By exercising this, by practicing this through phone calls, through communication, through interaction with your colleagues, through interaction with your clients, through managing expectations around your performance, etc., you bring the issue to the surface and bringing it to the surface is absolutely core to bringing this to um, your company discussing policies and then the society um, be, uh, discussing policies around this. So um, I was invited today on this panel um, preliminary as a, as a diversity expert perhaps or someone who's, a, who's very active in diversity on feminist issues. I don't think this is a feminist issue and I, and I very much agree with what May said. I mean it's not, it's not a matter for women. If we let this erode women's performance, if we let healthcare erode women's performance. We let, we let it erode the role of women in businesses, the role of women in the society, and the role of women um, as, um, as uh, caregivers and mothers and uh, you know, in, their, in their private sphere as well. So um, I would say it's, it's very much a social issue. I agree with, with what they raised, uh, but you know, you know, put that aside as well. It's very much a business issue. If we just look at the numbers that you have shared with us earlier, I mean, um, you know, uh, the numbers are just staggering of how, you know, 2.2 billion is lost in productivity from menopause every single year in the, in the US alone. And, you know, women spend on average 24 years in the workforce in their menopausal state, you know, according to midday. This is all like very strong figures that uh, employers should be looking carefully, you know, even if we don't care about uh, pri private healthcare even if we don't care about, you know, the society care about your business, you know, it, it's, it makes sense. It's, um, it's important and it can actually lead to, to better earnings for our companies as well to focus on these, um, on these issues from early on. 
Totally. I think you've, you've said it all, and it's so great that you're bringing in this point around signaling and how small behaviors, small, small actions can signal and give permission to more actually women to talk about what they need, what they go through, how they feel. I love I loved your example. It made me, for a moment, it made me go, ah, is this possible? Why is this happening? <laughs> but I'm really glad you had that experience. It means it is possible. So we're talking about the employers. Dimitri, what, what does it take to create that culture that Nikki is describing? And how can employers or should employers enable women to have these conversations or support them in all the different stages of their life that may affect also their productivity or the way, the way they show up at work? Well, uh, true. I mean, it, it's surprisingly that something that should come naturally, it comes with a push actually to, from 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 many angles. So, uh, I, I was I was lucky enough uh, throughout my career to have worked with uh, equally uh, um, uh, women and men leaders who were putting the family first and uh, uh, kind of. Uh, uh, situations where um, uh, a child, a daughter or a son was calling or there was a kind of an emergency, uh, they were first, uh, they were putting first the family rather than, than the business. So uh, this also creates and, and helps me to mold in, in a certain way to support uh, as an HR now uh, the, 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 any business I work for. So creating that culture is, is not difficult. Of course, it, it takes a boost from the top um, and, 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 and usually comes top down, uh, but also um, um, with the need, as, as we say, like to create this uh, balance, equality and equity, it's, uh, I think it's uh, just um, as, as important as, uh, as any other time. So um, first of all, uh, I, we, we try to create an environment where, as we said, everybody feels inclusive. I remember um, two things. When I was working in the US, and I'm not sure if that changed, I left uh, the, the business from the US back in 2020. Um, I was looking at the maternity leave and uh, I realized that um, in the state I was working, uh, maternity leave was uh, two weeks because it was perceived as uh, a sick leave. It was quite preposterous. I said, like, how can maternity leave be only two weeks and be perceived as uh, part of, uh, of a sick leave? So, of course, the companies have done tremendous uh, efforts in order to change that. And, and now we see that this has changed in the US, of course, in Europe, leading uh, with a leader in the UK giving up to 12 months maternity leave. Uh, you see that this changes. And I also see that changing uh, now I'm in the Middle East. Um, beyond that, uh, there are new trends, uh, which unfortunately they come now out uh, and have not been harmonized across the world, uh, that uh, they provide the paid leave for um, uh, menstrual periods. So uh, this, is, this is an issue that uh, I, I don't think many companies or even many countries have touched upon now so far. So uh, from the area in the Middle East I am, I know that India has uh, progressed into that area. I know that uh, Spain has progressed in Europe in that area, providing paid leave. And this is something that pretty much is also proposed uh, uh, how to support uh, uh, in, during the uh, menopause period on, as an employer and what should we do uh, in order to create this environment where we uh, support longevity in uh, in, in uh, uh, career um, and not to fail whatever we built so far by attracting female candidates, uh, train them, retain them, just to miss them uh, at, that, at the top level of their career. Um, one of the areas that uh, um, is, is proposed uh, in, in many ways is to assign uh, and appoint a, a menopause champion. This is very new, but I believe that this is very important for uh, if, if, if there are any taboos still uh, in, in that area, which I, I, I strongly suggest that th these taboos should completely be uh, demolished uh, and, and uh, just be open with anything that uh, impacts our lives. Uh, but assigning a champion can also lead to uh, a solution of uh, uh, the support that each individual needs uh, throughout the period. As, 
it is anxiety, it is um, um, uh, a change in the hormones, it's a need with the insurance. Insurance definitely should support us. We try to support maternity, we try to support IVF, then we should lead further to support the uh, menopause period with whatever that um, uh, cost brings uh, to, to which, which is with much less uh, than the cost that $150 billion uh, only in the US uh, by losing those professionals. So um, from the company side, uh, we need to change the culture. But as I said before, we need to change the culture when uh, even from, from the children's side. So I have a daughter and a son. Um, and I remember when they were uh, in the UK at school, um, uh, sometimes they would used to call each other bossy. And I said, don't, don't mistake in the leadership style with the authoritative or autocratic style. So most of them, even if it is a leadership style, we should stop calling it bossy or authoritative or overconfidence. Um, and, and there are real examples in my HR world where the same CV, once presented as a man, was more like, oh, what a confident guy, what a, a great leader. And once the same CV was presented as a woman, which was actually a woman, was uh, presented as, uh, oh, it's a quite overconfident, it's quite bossy, it's quite... So it's, it's the same feeling that we need to, from our generation, to stop. And I'm optimistic and uh, wishful and faithful that the next generation, as May said, your daughter may, my daughter will have completely different style and they will change the, the, whatever we try to achieve today, they will naturally change it uh, in the years to come. That, that, that's, a, that's the best wish, to be honest, for everything we're discussing today, Dimitris. And I really like your example is this research there, Holly and Howard, if I'm not mistaken, research, right, that Holly comes across as probably too bossy where Howard comes across as a lovely as a lovely gentleman um, I really like and thank you so much for your helpful also mentions of examples of what employers can do because a lot of times we are losing ourselves into big strategies but even small things like champions as you mentioned or menstrual leaves there are small things that can get us there slowly 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 because cultural transformation does take longer naturally uh, thank you, Dimitris. So, Marina, coming coming to you, can tech, or maybe how can tech, help us with all this? And we live in an era that we are very lucky, we said before, we are lucky that we can talk about subjects like the one we are opening today. We are also very lucky because we live in an era where technology has progressed and we have so many tools in our hands. We would love to hear from you and also you can give us just a quick intro to you and all the great things that you're doing around how tech can give some answers. Great. Um, uh, let's see, I, can you see my screen? We can see your screen, but not your presentation, great. it's your desktop. Okay, great. There, can you see it now? Yes. Wonderful. So thank you so much for having me here today. It's a fascinating conversation and um, I have some thoughts on some of the things that have been said. Um, I thought Nikki's story about the interruption was absolutely beautiful. And I think it's a great example where um, we as women can start to set the stage of what is okay, you know? And um, so I had the exact same experience when I saw a man on a, an important Zoom presentation uh, interrupt to talk to his child. And I had the exact same reaction that Nikki was talking about. And you know we should all be doing that and show by example what is okay. So uh, I'm the mother of four children, um, and I was raising them as we were building our startup. I brought them into the office with me, um, so I have sort of a unique uh, experience on that front. Um, I have a master's from MIT in mechanical engineering, and um, found I was looking for a technology to commercialize and found a 3D printing technology at MIT. Four of us co-founded the business. I was the CEO. Um, we were ranked the fastest growing business in New England in 2001, uh, had um, market share number two in the market. Uh, so we were one of the early market leaders in 3D printing and then sold the business in 2005. Since that time, I've been on corporate boards, done a little bit of angel investing, 
I do a lot of work with the Greek startup ecosystem, which is really starting to blossom. And so um, it's really exciting to see what's happening there. Um, and uh, I am also a writer. So my writing is at windystreet.com if you want to check it out. Um, so I want to start with the elephant in the room. What we're sitting here talking about women. Let's just stand back. What makes women different than men? And the most fundamental thing I can think of is that in terms of its impact on the workplace is that most biological women can get pregnant. Secondly, women have babies and these babies turn into children. Um, and most or many women want to be the primary caretaker or even if they don't want to be, they are. Um, and uh, when you look at the numbers, it's actually kind of daunting because peak fertility for a woman, uh, assuming she wants to have babies, uh, her peak fertility is from her late teens through her 20s. And if we look at her career, she graduates high school at 18, graduates college at 22. Let's say she goes to business school for a couple of years right out of college. She's 24. She gets her first job at 24 to 27. So she is barely in the workforce when her fertility starts dropping. Um, and this is a very big factor in the working life of a woman. So um, thankfully, there are a lot of enabling technologies that allow for family planning and for postponing childbirth. Um, so this starts with contraception, but then it moves on to IVF. Uh, my twin daughters were um, through IVF. Uh, donor eggs, egg freezing, um, and then obviously the internet is an incredible source of education and information for probing through these new technologies which are changing every day. Um, so it all starts um, after we're dealing with the postponement, let's say you know, you're finally ready to have a baby and you have a newborn. And we talked somewhat, um, there was some discussion, Dimitri talked about um, sort of newborn care, and family leave. Um, and I, you know, having had twins as my first children, uh, I can attest to the fact of how totally overwhelming it is. We uh, actually launched our product uh, two months after I gave birth. So, I mean, I know how insane this, this period of life is, but I would like to argue that the one thing newborns have going for them is that you can, to some degree, fit them within a working schedule. You can hire care and they can come and leave within a schedule. And so there is the possibility of working. When the children, when a baby turns into a child, that to me is when all bets are off. Children need oversight, they need discipline. There are a lot of decisions that need to be made. They need lots of different kinds of food. They need variety. They need emotional support. You need to be talking to them. They have an infinite number of activities that need to be scheduled. You're driving them all over the place. They're getting sick all the time. And they, at that point, can tell the difference between you and somebody else. And so it you know, breaks your heart every time you're dropping them off at daycare because they're crying and they don't want you to leave. And so you start your working day, you know, yourself semi in tears. Um, and so to me, this is um, a very challenging period. Um, so sort of when the child starts walking, let's say uh, year one through year 12, when they start to become more independent or even 10. Um, these to me are the really, really challenging years um, for a woman in the workforce. And I think that's when work flexibility is really required. And so we're talking about the hours that a woman works, the days that she works, the fact that there are always going to be last minute change of plans, somebody sick at, sick at home, can't find help. Um, having asynchronous working hours is huge. I did a tremendous amount of my work late at night after everyone else had gone home, I was, you know, and the children were finally asleep, then I could get onto my computer and start working. Um, remote work is this incredible blessing of COVID uh, that has become available. I would have given so much 
And whenever I write about uh, remote work, um, I catch myself because part of the reason I'm griping is because I'm so jealous that that was not available when I had young children. I would have given anything for just like one day a week that I could work from home. Um, and then the other is just being available when you're not going to be present at work to have some connection to work so that you're not completely removed from the action. As CEO, I didn't want to just totally cut off and um, not be a part of what was going on. So um, the technologies, you know, starting with portable laptops that you can take with you wherever you're going, the power of the phone, um, which has come about much more since my children grew to be more independent. Um, but I did have the advantage of email. Now you've got Teams, you've got Slack, Zoom, which didn't exist back then. Um, and then you've got things like Bright Horizons and other on-site daycare centers. For me, um, I was lucky as the owner of the business, I brought my twins into the office for the first year of their life. We had a nanny who was there with them. They took over my office. And so I could see them all day, um, kind of come in and out. It was a beautiful thing. Um, it made that first year so much more manageable because I, I wasn't so heartbroken, you know, like leaving them. Um, every day I could actually bring them with me. Um, and we had that daily commute together. Um, other uh, enabling technologies more in general, you know, we have Dear Kate period underwear. It's a startup that I invested in. Um, Next Gen Jane, which tests period blood for disease, Nixit menstrual cups, um, Row digital health clinics, Myovant Sciences are working on endometriosis treatment. Flare is a safety bracelet that allows women to exit an unsafe situation by having a fake phone call come through. Um, and Vivian Lab, uh, thank you so much for inviting me today, um, in providing expertise in really, uh, women's health and wellness issues. Um, other enabling technologies have come about in the area of fertility and childbirth. Uh, we have kind body and carrot fertility, um, making it more accessible. Clue ovulation tracker, tracking symptoms at each point um, of a woman's cycle. Maven is a virtual clinic for family planning through postpartum. Lactap um, provides information about lactation. LV Kegel trainer is for bladder control after giving birth. Willow is a wearable breast pump. Um, and then monitoring cameras. I mean, uh, I can't be the only mother who is like deeply concerned about my child's care. Um, you know, when you're bringing on a new caretaker who you've never met before. Um, I didn't actually use monitoring cameras, but I love the fact that that is something that is available. Um, and then other technologies that have come about since my children uh, got older, Uber, would have been huge when my children um, were of an age with that I would have been comfortable having them use it. Um, Amazon, Instacart, you know, some of these technologies that have just been so time saving um, for uh, working mothers, um, really game changers. And then we've got women um, in the older age dealing with menopause, um, Renovia app for pelvic floor disorder, Joy Lux and Vela for sexual function issues after menopause. Um, and there was a startup out of MIT that was providing cooling relief. Uh, and there are other startups that do this for women's hot flashes during sleep because um, hot flashes really interrupt a woman's sleep um, profile after menopause. And so providing this cooling relief that can um, operate automatically uh, can make a woman get more sleep and therefore um, be, able, be able to go into the work environment more naturally. Um, interestingly, um, and uh, this is something I just learned yesterday. Thank you uh, for this information. Um, Gen X um, is, these are women in their late forties. They're very comfortable with technology, very adept with social media, um, and yet, as you notice, the startups I mentioned 
Um, and this is, you know, based on research I've done and startups I've seen, they tend to focus on menstrual health and fertility, pregnancy, and then they jump to menopause. And there's just like a group in there that they're kind of missing um, of women in their late 40s um, that have their own uh, issues to deal with. So in terms of challenges, I mean, I do a lot of work with startups and they have very limited resources. They're sort of in survival mode. So dealing with a lot of these um, issues that you're talking about is just not in their scope. Um, and then you've got larger companies. I have worked on boards of companies that want to bring women leaders. Um, these are in tech. And so they're looking for women who have been CEOs of large tech startups. And um, then this is sort of 10 years ago that I was um, on these boards. Um, and at that time, there just was not a huge pool of women to choose from, although there are some great organizations now that are set up to help find those women and help place them into these boards that are very much looking to expand their boards and diversify their boards and bring women on that just didn't have those networks to find those women. And so I think part of this is it takes time to flow through. I think schools are much more um, trying to gear the girls to not be afraid of STEM and to go into the STEM fields and the same in college. I know at MIT, half the women in mechanical engineering, half the students in mechanical engineering in the graduate school are women. Um, and ultimately this will flow through to entry level positions and to senior level positions. Um, and it does take time. I do think things will get better. Um, today, women make up only 28% of the STEM workforce, um, but I'm hoping that as schools and colleges bring more women in, that over time, this will flow through um, <clears throat> and that women leaders then will be brought on to join boards. You know, I think this conversation today has been so valuable, so critical. Women want to learn, work, they want to contribute, and they want to advance in their careers. The thing to keep in mind is that the most educated women, the ones who have the most value to add, are the ones who have the most choice. It's the easiest for them to opt out of the workforce. And I think that's what we've been seeing as we looked at this data today. And that's the um, what we have to work uh, to prevent. Um, society needs women to work and to contribute. And girls need strong role models and a strong sense of empowerment. And um, the one thing I wanted to say, just to add on to May's point um, earlier about the role of men, I think it's really important that uh, as this conversation was today, and especially including Dimitri in the conversation, is that men have to be a part of this. Um, we have to be careful in how we talk about this. We don't want to scare girls. Um, that this is a horrible world and that, uh, you know, men are out to get them or something like that. There, we have a history we have to contend with and we're all working together to change that history. And I have to say from my own personal experience that men have been incredibly supportive, both in school, college, in the workforce, in terms of mentoring and helping me advance in my career. And, um, so I really want to shout out to the men who are helping advance uh, this. Um, but you know, this takes time. Um, we need to initiate these steps. We have to have these conversations. And I think at the end, um, that is what is going to change it and make things better. Wow. Thank you so much, Marina. I mean, that was a very comprehensive, almost actually masterclass of how we start as women, we go through life, what is that we face as years go by and how today's world can help with everything it has to offer. Yeah, and, and I, I also want to say one last thing, sort of as we're mm -hmm. thinking about how we raise our girls is not to forget in all this conversation, it is incredibly difficult. I think we all understand what it's like to be the primary caretaker in the house and um, hopefully, you know, that can shift over time, but, um, either way, I think it's important for us as women and to show our girls that being a mother 
um, as well as a working woman is an incredible opportunity. I mean, I wouldn't give that up for anything. And so um, while it does involve many challenges, um, it is also the greatest gift. Thank you for the very, that's the hope and the optimism that we need. And that's the way, the best way actually really to close. So thank you so much, um, Marina. Some really, really useful and insightful things that we heard then. Thank you for that. So as we wrap up, what I would love to ask from each one of you is just one, one idea, one, one piece of advice. What is that we can do from tomorrow in our little sphere of influence, whether we are an employer or an employee or a manager or a leader, whatever role we, we have in this, in this world, in this life, what is that you would suggest we did in order to move us forward in everything we discussed today? And May, could I please start with you? Yes, of course. I would say, following up to what I said before, is that uh, we should look to lead by example. We should start by having these difficult conversations that might seem like we're asking too much personal, uh, making, you know, asking a question which sounds too personal, but beyond the casual, are you okay? especially to women that are older than we are, because we see that's a cross-generational thing, we should go deeper into that beyond the are you okay and also see how we can contribute, acknowledge something is going on and contribute to the solution. Fantastic. Nikki? Mm, I think I have a, like a, 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 the advice is common for both uh, employees and employers and and it's engage. Whoever you are, at whatever stage you are right now, just engage with the issue. It's here to stay. It's actually uh, hurtful, important, um, and can have a very big impact uh, on women's healthcare. So you need to engage. If you're a woman, engage by, first of all, educating yourself about it. Like, I have no idea what, what's, what's coming in my menopause, and I have no idea, you know, what issues I might be facing then, and I should do. You know, I should be absolutely well aware and um, anticipating the symptoms as well as engaging with all the technologies and services and networks and, and uh, people that can support me and, and healthcare experts. So educate yourself, um, engage with, first of all, with your own self, but also your environment, your community, your family, your uh, employer on what your need might, needs might be. Uh, bring it on the table at every opportunity, just engage, constantly engage as a woman in this field. And if you're an employer, whether male or female, engage your employees. I mean, do go beyond the question, as May says, of, of are you okay? Go into the, um, what is happening with you right now? How can I help? What challenges are you facing? You know, how is your health care? Uh, how is your health? Um, have you seen any issues that are, um, um, you know, interfering with your performance or where with your role? So do engage with this because it's only gonna, gonna pave the way for a better future. Uh, I'm going to repeat something that Cheryl Sandberg says co constantly and it really strikes a chord with me uh, for businesses. It's not just the, the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. So, I mean, absolutely supporting the uh, women in their workplace in whatever way is possible. Thank you, Nikki. Dimitris? Well, thank you so much for including me today. It's, it was kind of an eye opener and uh, definitely it will, uh, it's a, a lot of food for thought on, on how to act from tomorrow. So uh, I think we are on the right path and, and uh, we have uh, made changes and more changes to come um, as uh, HR employers and also from the side of employees. So uh, for me, uh, it's very important to, uh, if we're talking about uh, the, the, how to uh, create that kind of environment, I think that the most important for us is to provide the, the needed support uh, and, and uh, to the individuals and on, 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 on a customized base. Um, I feel like to provide purpose or to support women on their purpose towards uh, leadership and also uh, help them in their career progress uh, but also provide recognition. Um, this is something that we most of the time forget uh, to recognize uh, in lives, in uh, employment. So I feel like uh, we are on the right way, but uh, with uh, the right approach, 
and uh, as mentoring mentioned before, uh, we will we will be able to thrive. So uh, thanks so much for having me today in 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 this uh, so important and uh, interesting conversation. Thank you so much for for bringing all your perspective and your great great advice, Dimitris. Marina, one last word from from you. Yeah, I mean, I think we all have opportunities all day long um, in every small way to elevate women, to invite them, to invite a young woman to a meeting of senior people, to um, invite women onto a panel that might be mostly men, to um, mentor a young woman. Uh, there's always somebody below you, whatever level you're at. And um, so I think um, there, are, there are opportunities every day to elevate a woman in the world. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Marina. Thank you so much, all of you, for the fantastic insight, the beautiful, the beautiful energy that you brought, and all your wisdom, all your knowledge, all your expertise. It's been a fantastic conversation that I hope everyone has found useful. I certainly have, and I keep taking notes of a lot of things that can help us can help move us forward. Um, as we're finishing, Zina, something to kind of close us off? Um, I think that technology has advanced a lot. So right now we can use this to our benefit. We don't, I don't think that women have to necessarily go to their employer and say that, you know, I'm struggling with infertility or I'm going through menopause. Some things are personal and they can be kept like that. But if the employer is proactive, and they offer the support women need without asking what's your condition, but like being able to choose among an array of benefits and not just the regular benefits like a gym coupon or food coupon, but offering like a bigger variety of benefits. I think this keeps a motivated um, talent in the company, can empower women and can also save um, a costs for the employer as well. So technology, let's use technology to our benefit. Personally, I'm, I'm leaving this uh, panel really inspired with uh, like being among so many successful people who are also parents and, and business people and leaders. So um, I would like to thank you because it's a huge honor that, that you uh, came to our panel and devoted your precious time. We learned so much and thank you. Thank you so much for opening this discussion for the very first time in in Europe, I would say, because the US maybe it has started, but in Europe we're very new uh, into, into these topics. Thank you, Gina. Thank, thank you, you so much. All, so, so much. Thank you for your time and thank you everyone for being with us. As I said, we will share material and the recording on our channels. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.